I, I had this need of something beyond this world actually giving me my purpose. And I didn't like that thought, but that's what I wanted. I thought, how can I think this? This is, you know, this is undermining my integrity as a human being. But still, there was a desire for that, and I, and it was not being able to cope with that meaning, meaninglessness that brought me back to Christianity. So, in a sense, it was both an emotional and an intellectual movement at the same time. Hello, and thanks for joining in. I'm Jana Harmon, and you're listening to the Side B Podcast, where we see how someone flips the record of their life. Each podcast, we listen to someone who has once been an atheist, but who unexpectedly became a Christian. There are those who have never had any belief in God and and embraced atheism from their youth. And there are those who once believed in God and then changed their mind, becoming an atheist. It's not uncommon to hear from skeptics that belief in God is nothing but blind faith that there is no evidence for God's existence. But sometimes, that's also the way religious people talk and believe as well. When difficult questions arise, we're sometimes told to just believe or just have faith in the midst of our doubts. By these statements, we are led to presume that there isn't much more than our willed faith, that there is no evidence to support our beliefs or perhaps we shouldn't even try to have a reasoned faith. For someone who is a thinker, an intellectual, who wants solid reasons to support his or her beliefs, this approach doesn't work very well. It may, in fact, cause many to leave their faith behind along with other perceived childhood fairy tales. In today's episode, Dr. Peter Harris lost his childhood Christian faith when confronted with intellectual challenge at university. He was hard-pressed to find any substantive answers for his questions other than to just have faith in faith. A seeming lack of evidence for Christianity did not satisfy his brilliant mind, and so he left it behind to become an atheist. What was it that drew him back to Christianity to now become one of its strongest intellectual defenders. I hope you'll come along to find out. Welcome to the Side B Podcast, Peter. It's so great to have you. Thank you very much for inviting me on. Thank you. As we're getting started, Peter, why don't you tell us a bit about who you are, where you live, perhaps your education? Okay. Um, I live in Gravesend, which is in the southeast corner of England. Um, I, at the tender tender age of 18, I went to the University of Cambridge to study history. Um, I've since acquired two master's degrees and two doctorates, um, one of which concerns the anti-theism of Christopher Hitchens, and the other was a study of the military service tribunals of the First World War, which essentially were committees set up to decide whether men who wished not to fight in the war could actually be allowed not to fight and perhaps do something else or have nothing to do with the war at all. Um, And that took about six and a half years to do that one, whereas the other one on Hitchens took me about three years uh, because I'd already read and listened and watched so much of what Hitchens had put out on the internet and in his books about his anti-theism. I'm married to um, Hesina and we have two children. Um, I work for Lucent University in in Texas. Um, I have created their online History of Christianity course, and I also work uh, as a high school teacher as well. So, yes, I'm very busy, but uh, what I do, I really enjoy. It sounds really quite fascinating. It it also speaks to your depth of of intellect and thought. Uh, You obviously like to think deeply about Mm, certain issues. You are driven by ideas, it sounds like. Uh, Very interested in in issues of of theology and history Mm. and, I guess, truth. I would imagine if I I understand um, you study apologetics and, and those kinds of things as well. So I'm 
terribly intrigued by <laughs> the story that you're going to tell us today because you are really quite an extraordinary person in terms of just liking to think about ideas and issues and and history, like especially Christianity in the context of history. I think that will come mm. into play when we hear more about your story because I know you didn't begin by... Um, on this side of, of understanding uh, Christianity and its history and, and understanding and teasing out uh, Christopher Hitchens antitheism that perhaps yeah. you were on his or more of his perspective, yeah. maybe not. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it sounds like you share brilliance. Let's just say that you share brilliance, <laughs> um, perhaps, uh, but, but uh, you perhaps also shared a bit of his, um, atheistic worldview mm. from the beginning, uh, mm. or somewhere along the line. And I'm as a as someone who's intrigued by your story. Why don't we start back at the beginning, and okay. and uh, tell me? Uh, obviously, you are from England. Yes. Did you grow up in England? Uh, is that your home? Yes, I I, I, I did. I've I've lived in England all my life. I have traveled fairly regularly abroad uh, because my wife is French and my children hold dual citizenship. They're both French and British. Um, and yes, I've, I've essentially lived for 52 years in England. Um, well, this is my 52nd year. I'm not yet 52, 51. So that, that sounds a bit better, doesn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, yes, I mean, I, I suppose in many ways I'm not only interested within my own culture, but also in, in other cultures as well. And, and in particular, I'm very interested in the United States also. It's, uh, it's American Christianity and its history that perhaps most intrigues me. Um, so yes, I mean, I, I, I suppose I do have a very British outlook, but I think I'm very cosmopolitan as well and very interested in other nations, cultures and histories and, and how Christianity has played a role in, in shaping and forming uh, nations and, and what they are today um, in, in their culture, their laws, their attitudes, and I suppose even their foreign policies. Mm, mm, that You do have a very broadened perspective, it sounds like, mm. very intentionally. So mm. so back uh, when you were growing up in England, yes, what was that culture like? What was, was it a Christian uh, cent, you know, centered culture? Mm. Was, was, was your family uh, religious at all? Why don't you Take me right. back to your roots. Yes, I, I think I would probably go back to the early 1980s when I was about 12, 11 or 12, uh, because I was in a, a church choir. I uh, sang for a local Anglican parish church. And I don't come from a Christian background. I, my parents never went to church. They never spoke much about faith or religion. Um, my grandparents, I don't think... Um, had any sort of regular church observance. So I came from a very sort of secular, uh, not de-Christianized context, but uh, I suppose an indifferent context. People just didn't worry about church. They didn't seem to think much about God. Uh, they weren't particularly hostile either. In fact, they weren't hostile at all. They were just indifferent to that side of life. And I would, I would say that maybe Britain in the 1980s was more overtly Christian than it is now, but the, the the slide away from Christianity really began in the 1890s, actually. Uh, there's evidence of church ministers at the end of the 19th century complaining that they were losing uh, congregants at, at quite a fast rate, and that decline has continued, and it really got going after the First World War, which I can only imagine is a consequence of people not being able to um, imagine God exists after having seen so much suffering mm. um, in hospitals and on battlefields. Um, so there has been a steady, relentless uh, drop away from church attendance in Britain. But we are still a very spiritual nation because generally um, when, when governments do censuses, they, they find that perhaps around about 70% of British people have a belief in the transcendent, the metaphysical, or some kind of God. Um, and that figure has been fairly consistent over, I think, probably the last 20 or 30 years. But it doesn't translate into church observance. So probably maybe 3 to 5% of the British population is in church on, on a Sunday morning. 
um, but 70% will say they believe in God. So that's a sort of context in which, uh, in which I grew up. But the, the, the wonderful thing about my childhood is that I went, um, well, my parents made some very good choices as to which school to send me as a child. And they sent me to a grammar school where I had to pass an exam to get into this grammar school. Um, and it was a school that had a Christian headmaster or principal, and there were lots of Christian teachers. Now, it was not a Christian school. It was a, it was a public school, a state school. But I became a Christian because I went to that school. Um, that school had a Christian union. There were many Christian members of staff. There was one particular member of staff who organized this Christian union so that we would have prayer meetings before the day began. Um, students would gather to pray on a Thursday evening after school. And I, um, I became a Christian whilst I was participating in a school production of a musical called Fiddler on the Roof. And as I'm sure everyone's aware, in that musical, um, there are Russian Jews living in the early, early 20th century who are awaiting the Messiah. And I like to think that I actually found the Messiah during, during that, that time. And, and the reason why is that I, um, I heard the gospel being um, explained by members of the school cast who are also Christians. And I was the easiest convert. Um, I heard once and I believed immediately. And I took one of the gospel tracts from one of these students who had told my group of friends the gospel. I took it home. Uh, my parents did not like me um, reading late at night. They wanted me to go to sleep. So I would use a torch and I would hide under the, the blankets or the covers and read. And I read that tract by torchlight. I uh, said the prayer at the end and became a Christian. And I felt tremendous love and peace. Um, and I wasn't expecting that. No one told me that that would happen. And I concluded that that was God, that, the that I had been reconciled with God. Um, but my loss of faith occurred when I was 19. Um, and when I look back on that time of my life, I have drawn some very serious lessons and when I think back to that time in my life, I, to some extent, that shapes what I do now as an apologist, um, because I lost my faith at university. And I think it's tragic because I'm aware of some of the statistics regarding how many young people go to university or college as Christians and come out as atheists and agnostics. And they're not prepared to, you know, to be able to answer some of the really difficult questions that will come their way. Um, I, I'm aware of a Christian apologist who's also a biologist. And he said that on the very first day of his, one of his lecture series, the lecturer who was teaching evolutionary science said to the class, um, stand up if you are a Christian. And he stood up. There were a few other people who stood up. And he said, well, by the end of this course, you won't be, I can assure you. Um, which is appalling discrimination. I mean, if, if you had a Christian lecturer who did it the other way around, um, you know, the, the Twitter would be uh, in, in uproar. Um, so I, I'm very, very concerned about that particular age group. So it, it sounds like as a child you, you came mm. to believe quite yes. readily and you experienced mm. what you mm. It, uh, what you thought was a Christian life and you felt the love and peace of God. And that, yes. I guess, was a fairly settled thing for you um, that you lived in. Were you active in your faith during your teen years? I'm just curious. And and were you taught more or discipled in any way intellectually mm. um, before you got to college to how to think mm. in more worldview or grander terms than uh, the simple gospel? Yeah, that, that's a brilliant question because it really helps me to elucidate my own experience. Um, I, I left my Anglican church when my voice broke um, because I didn't want to sing the harmony section. I, I quite like singing the melody, which is what the treble <laughs> and sopranos do. Right. <laughs> um, so my voice broke just short of my 13th birthday. Um, I'd gone through that, that sort of croaking frog stage that many boys do as their voice is breaking and then finally the adult voice emerges. Um, my, my church essentially was my Christian union at school. 
for about four years. Um, that's where I got my fellowship. That's where I got my teaching from. That's what gave me the opportunity to pray and, and to worship God. Um, because I was, I was a little bit scared about um, going to church by myself because I knew that no one else in my family would go. Right. But when I got to the age of 16, um, I decided that I wanted to go to church. And I remember in the January of 1986, um, going to a local Pentecostal church, which was about two minutes walk from my house. And I fell in love with that kind of worship, uh, although I'm not in Pentecostalism anymore. I, I'm an Anglican again, but I, I have very fond memories of that church because the worship was very warm. It was very authentic. People always seemed pleased to see me, <laughs> mm. um, uh, which is really important for a teenager. <laughs> um, and um, I remember enjoying the preaching. Um, I liked the people. The people were very, very welcoming. Um, and that continued for two years until I was 18, and then I went to university. But your, your question, was I, was I discipled? I would say no. Um, people showed interest in me, but there was no one individual who spent regular time with me, which again, I think is really important. Um, and secondly, I certainly had no knowledge or understanding of how to defend the gospel against intellectual attack. Um, for me, C.S. Lewis was a writer of children's stories. He was not the author of mere Christianity or, or the abolition of man or, or the problem of pain or whatever. He, he was not an apologist. He was a writer of children's stories. And that, that's great. I mean, I, I think everything he wrote is, is amazing, but it, it's hard to formulate an argument on the basis of fiction. Um, although sometimes you can. I mean, I know philosophers do write fiction to explain their ideas, like the existentialists, but I had never, I had no training. And so when I, when I went to university, I was very lucky for the first year because I had two very good friends who were uh, Christians. They were in their final year. They were two years older than me, and they really took me under their wing. And I ended up going to a Presbyterian church. So, <laughs> <laughs> so whilst, whilst I was at at college, I was going to a Presbyterian church, you know, dressing up smartly, taking my Bible, and going and enjoying hour and a half long sermons. Which I mean, I love long sermons, and so I, I love my Presbyterian church. But on, in vacation, I would come back to my Pentecostal church, where which is very different. And, and I had, I suppose, I, I drew a lot from both those those Christian traditions. Um, it was it was a true Reformed Presbyterian church. It was not a liberal Presbyterian church, and. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a very there was very faithful preaching of the gospel, very faithful preaching of the word, generally. But again, I, I did not have any sort of education regarding the defence of the gospel against sceptics, and that's what basically um, undermined things for me. Um, um, in my second year, I made friends with an individual who was a real anti-theist. I mean, he he had no time at all for Christianity. He had no time at all for any religion. And because he was studying philosophy, he knew all the arguments against religion. Um, and so he would present to me David Hume's scepticism regarding the teleological argument or um, the cosmological argument. Um, he would present to me Hume's argument against miracles. And I'd never heard any of, any of this in my life. Mm. And I was defenseless in the face of what he was saying. But I do remember being tormented by this question of whether my faith was true. And I would say that there were in intellectual and emotional forces working at the same time, in the sense that I had this desire to be an academic, an intellectual. And I had come to the conclusion that to be one of those, I could not be a Christian. Because everybody I knew who was teaching me uh, was not a Christian or never spoke about any kind of faith. Um, a lot of the very bright undergraduates with whom I was studying had no faith either and they, they, they found it ridiculous to be a Christian and I remember one evening it was a Sunday evening um, and I, I get the impression from my memory that it was it was maybe a Sunday evening in November I don't know whether you I'm, I, I, you, you probably know a lot about the British climate because you studied in Britain but Britain seems to specialize in really gloomy dark wet cold November evenings so that's 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 why I think it's November yes. and I decided <laughs> and I decided I was going to answer this question once and for all and I 
decided to call upon uh, an acquaintance of mine who struck me as the most spiritual person I knew. I mean, he emanated peace and love and gentleness and all that sort of thing. He, he seemed to me to be a living saint. And I thought, if anybody knows the answer, he does. And I remember calling on his lodgings. He was renting a room outside of college, so was I. So I was on my way home from studying in the library all day. It was a Sunday evening. I went and knocked on his door, and he opened his door, and he looked rather perturbed at seeing me because I got the impression that he was going to have an early night because he had a week of lectures and seminars and experiments to do. He was, he was studying natural science. And, yeah, he was a gentleman. He invited me in. He made me a cup of tea. And I remember in the course of the conversation saying to him, um, can you give me a, a reason why I should be a Christian? And, and I knew, I, I, I believe that, that he could give me the answer. And I remember he looked rather startled because the conversation now had become very serious. And he sat there and he thought for a few moments and he said to me, uh, Peter, it's faith. You just have to believe it. And, and that was the last answer I wanted. I mean, if right. there was an answer I didn't want, it was that one. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so I remember leaving. I, I remember, No, actually, I remember saying to him, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I must have said it very robotically because I didn't mean a word of what I was saying. I said to him, thank you for your answer. You have put my mind at rest. Actually, the complete opposite was the case. And when I left right. his, his lodgings and cycled home, I decided, yes, I am now an atheist. If that's the best Christianity can do, I, I'm not a Christian anymore. Um, and my, my faith sort of flickered on and flickered off over the next sort of four years. But by the age of 23, I was a, I was a pretty, pretty hardened atheist. I mean, I probably would have defined myself as an agnostic, but I, I, I behaved like an atheist. I didn't pray. I didn't read the Bible just in case God was there. I didn't investigate any other religions either. Um, but I do remember being very hardened in my scepticism. Um, and at times being quite aggressive in my response to Christians, which I don't like to think about now. I mean, I remember uh, when I was in my hometown of Chatham, uh, there, was a man, there was a man with a megaphone preaching the gospel outside a McDonald's restaurant where loads of people were. And he, he was a member of the Salvation Army. And I remember shouting out at him, why don't you shut up? Um, oh, my, <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so it got that bad um, yeah. so here I was you know saved, very easily saved at the age of 12 and here I am now um, being rude to a street preacher and he ignored me of course um, I walked on but that was my attitude at that time yeah I'd like to pause for a moment and tell you about the C.S. Lewis Institute we are living in a day and time when Christianity is being increasingly marginalized and even cancelled when distractions are prevalent and intentionality towards spiritual growth is curbed. More than ever, we are in need of deeper intentional discipleship as we face challenges in today's world. The C.S. Lewis Institute is here to serve you, your study groups, and your church in creating mature disciples who know and live out their biblically grounded faith in Jesus Christ. They provide thoughtful, intelligent resources for individuals, groups, and Bible studies. They provide a year-long fellows program for spiritual growth among like-minded Christians pursuing faith in a serious, structured way. And they host events with respected Christian authors and thinkers to help us understand scripture and the Christian worldview. They also help us engage culture in effective ways. We hope you'll not only take a look at these offerings, but also prayerfully consider donating to this ministry. You can find out more about the C.S. Lewis Institute and give by going to our website at www.cslewisinstitute.org. Now back to our story. Well, that's, um, I can see how that would happen. Mm. Like you say, disappointing to lose that one thing that you, you had that gave you peace. Yeah. But you were doing it in an honest way, though. Mm. I would imagine as someone who was an intellectual, who wanted, mm. to be, who wanted to pursue life as an intellectual, that you had to be 
honest with your beliefs. And there was no other option for you. Yeah. If if at that time you felt that that belief was blind, mm. that it was just a matter of faith, almost in faith, yes, that, right. that that wasn't sufficient. Um, and I mm. guess especially to, I mean, all of those to whom you looked up uh, to, mm. you know, in the intellectual, in academia, mm. were all non-believers. So right. I can see why you would move that direction, but I imagine you felt a loss, at, at least at the beginning. Yeah. But like you say, it kind of flickered on and off. So I right. presume you kind of just moved into that that understanding, a more sobered um, understanding, this is the way life is, you know. Mm. And I, again, as an intellectual, that's how you pursued Mm. your reality and uh, yes. and pursued your 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 education and, and whatnot so yes um i i'm curious at this point in mm. in your within your atheism did it change the way you lived your life were you intellectually honest enough to really look at the underbelly as it were the logical mm. implications of your own worldview as as an atheist well th again that's a, a really really interesting question um i when i look back on that time i i don't see any significant drop in the moral standards of my life um i i think that i had a pretty i've always had a pretty good moral moral compass um and so from the age of 23 until 27 when my, my faith was restored um i basically live for myself, which I suppose in itself is not right. But I don't remember, you know, my life going off the rails. I mean, I was teaching at the time. I was enjoying my, my work as a teacher. I, I had my life all mapped out. Um, I would go, you know, for drinks with friends at the weekend. I would go to the gym a lot. I'd write and publish poetry. So I, I don't see I don't see any sort of catastrophic decline in behavior um, in terms of whether I thought much about the implications of my atheism uh, the one that really did worry me was um, the fact that I couldn't now believe in any sense of an afterlife um, and I suppose I was very young and very healthy and there was no you know there's no immediate chance of my leaving this mortal coil as it were but every now and then I would I would stop and think, well, what happens when I die? Because one day I will, uh, no matter how strong and healthy I feel at the moment, no matter how much sort of life is enjoyable, I, I'm going to eventually leave. And, and what is there? And I, I sort of clung on to the thought that there could be an afterlife. Now, there was no God in this afterlife, but this afterlife would somehow be a continuation of, of what I was doing on Earth, which is impossible because my body would be dead and, and I would be some sort of disembodied, uh, fragment uh, that that was one thing that troubled me and I, I think that the, the the major problem that I had was a sense of meaninglessness um, now the the problem of pain and suffering or the problems of pain and suffering have never been a, a problem for me um, in in the sense that I I I can understand or I can I can see a struggle between good and evil in the world um, and even as an atheist, I never really use that argument against Christians. Um, my concern as an atheist was whether life had any meaning. And that's why I was drawn to the existential philosophers and Soren Kierkegaard, who was a Christian existentialist, and Martin Heidegger, who actually argued he wasn't an existentialist, but Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, and Simone de Beauvoir. And their solution, or Sartre's solution, uh, and I assume de Beauvoir's as well, was that you create your own meaning. There's no transcendent, there's no metaphysical entity that gives you your meaning. You have to create it for yourself in the midst of a, a material universe that is that is just there, it's a brute fact. And in my bravest moments, that made sense. But every now and then, um, I would think, well, actually, I, I wouldn't mind having a transcendent meaning attached to me. Uh, and every now and then, I would have a feeling that I had been created um, and I didn't like that feeling because, of course, I had adopted the notion that I am an evolved creature, that I am physical matter that's highly organized, but nothing more. 
Um, but every now and then there was a sense that I had been created as well. Um, and in my bravest moments, I would, I would, let's say I'd be walking home. And one of the symbols of meaningless, meaninglessness was the stars. Now that sounds really strange, but I, I, had come to the conclusion that, that life was meaningless because it was predetermined. There was nothing you could do to change the course of your life. It just happened to you. And you just had to be brave and try in some way to resist, even though ultimately you're going to lose. I would defy the meaninglessness of my life by trying to give it some sort of meaning. But that didn't seem sufficient. I, I had this need of something beyond this world actually giving me my purpose and I didn't like that thought but that's what I wanted I thought how can I think this this is you know this is undermining my integrity as a human being but still there was a desire for that and I and it was not being able to cope with that meaning meaninglessness that brought me back to Christianity so in a sense it was both an emotional and an intellectual movement at the same time that brought me back at the age of 27 so you say it was an emotional and intellectual movement, mm. yeah, that, that existential ang angst, as it were. Yeah, and then, I think it is. So, so how did you make that movement? Obviously, you were it's almost like Lewis's argument from desire. There was something in you that wanted mm. more and yeah. that, that there had to be a source underlying lying that or a source. Um, mm. And so how, how were you able to, to, to move from this place of, mm. of wanting and desiring something more, but knowing that it didn't exist in reality. Mm. How did you bridge that gap from non-belief yeah. towards belief? Okay. Um, well, during those, I suppose, four years of really quite hardened atheism, I never once heard the gospel. The only people who showed any sort of interest in my soul, as it were, were two sets of Jehovah's Witnesses who knocked on my door and I was happy to engage them in debate and I argued from an atheist point of view. But they seemed to be genuinely interested in the state of my soul. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I, I didn't have any any Christian contact at all. I, I had two colleagues who were Christians. One was a rather sour, bitter individual and I, I thought to myself, he's not a very good advert for Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, yeah. he had a book on his desk which was uh, titled how to reach your colleagues with with the gospel and i thought oh. well you you haven't done a very good job because yeah. no one will listen to you because you're so unpleasant to talk to yes. um but <laughs> but the the other individual uh, was the head of rs religious studies and he left after a year and went on to become a baptist minister and i was very impressed with him both professionally and personally. I, I, I sensed he was a man of integrity. Um, and so that started to make me think again. Um, you know, maybe there is something to this. But I never attended church. I never heard any gospel dem gospel proclamation at all. I had not thrown my Bible away, which is interesting. I, I still had my little red pocket miniature Bible that I'd bought as an undergraduate years earlier. And I didn't throw it away because I felt that even though I didn't believe it, it there was something wrong in throwing the Bible in the bin. I, I couldn't do it. There was some, it, it was too sacred, as it were. Um, and I couldn't explain to myself why I felt that way, but I just couldn't do that. Um, what happened was um, I remember standing in my kitchen and I remember looking up at the clock on the wall um, because I had to go to work that morning. And I was making sure I wasn't going to be late. And... I remember saying the, 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 the following prayer. I said, God, if you exist, and I, like, and I do remember saying, God, if you exist, um, would you help me? Uh, would you tell me why I'm here? What, what am I doing? What is my life for? Where is it going? So it wasn't a prayer of repentance. It wasn't a prayer to, to say sorry for all the things I'd done wrong and think the good things I hadn't done. It was actually... Uh, a prayer that was asking God to be a philosopher on my behalf and sought out this problem of meaninglessness. And I did not get an answer from God. I didn't hear a voice. I didn't you know, see a piece of paper floating down from the ceiling saying, you know, Peter, this is your purpose. What I got instead was what I hadn't had for a long time, and that is a sense of God's presence and his love again. And I, my heart started to soften. 
um, towards Christianity. Now, I didn't go back to church. Um, I still had no Christian contact. Um, it was as if there were internal forces that had brought me to that point. It wasn't any sort of external encouragement from, from friends or acquaintances. It just happened. And I can only imagine that there was some sort of seismic shift within my, my thinking and my feeling. Um, but again, I, I couldn't tolerate this this question of meaninglessness or this issue of meaninglessness anymore. And I remember walking to work. I never, I did not drive to work. I, I like to walk to clear my mind and think about the day ahead. And I remember f feeling someone was walking alongside me, and and it felt like Jesus. And and I'm I'm not prone to sort of you know spiritual mystical experiences, but that was very strong. And I and um, and, and I thought this, this is becoming real again to me. And, and luckily, I, I had a local library where there were some very good commentaries on the Bible. And I remember getting a book out. I can't remember the name of the author or the name of the book. I can still see his picture, though. He was a, an elderly man with, with thick spectacles. But he, in his book, he wrote about the historical reliability of the New Testament. And for the first time, I came across an actual formal defense of Christianity. And I thought, I have been wanting something like this for so long and i remember reading that book and marveling at this at this man's um intelligence his ability to present christianity as true and all the thoughts i had about the bible being you know a plethora of legends and, and make-believe and superstitious and nonsense uh, gibberish basically started to melt away and and my 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 trust my intellectual trust in christianity started to be recreated again um you know well i never had it but it was being created for me um but i didn't go to church for a year um i stayed away from church but my my faith was a very private thing and it but it started to grow again i i fell in love with the bible again i i really like the book of daniel i really really like the book of romans uh, i really like the book of ruth and the the notion of hell troubled me i thought well you know if people are not you know, if people are not repentant, God will um, so put them out of His put them out of His presence. But the thing that helped me overcome that was I thought, well, look what God has done to stop people from going there. What more could God do? Uh, so that was, uh, you know, an, an important apologetic for me regarding God's judgment. Um, and it was only when I moved back to the southeast because I'd been teaching in the Midlands, the the, the middle region of Britain. When I moved, I was living in Lincolnshire, and I moved back to Kent and uh, the southeast, and and that's when I rejoined the church, and 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 I started to again to to, to read and explore what apologists, Christian philosophers, and, and scientists and writers had to say, and it was a steady education, and I I found it to be absolutely vital because, and that's one of the reasons why I I get quite irritated if people dismiss apologetics because that was my lifeline that's mm -hmm. what reignited my faith and when people dismiss that and say it's not important it, it's rather like someone saying well you know you were rescued at sea by the lifeguard but or the coast guard but the coast guard is not really important mm -hmm. well sorry you know <laughs> yes <laughs> my salvation is quite important <laughs> yes and the salvation of a lot of people who, who who come to faith in that way so it was it was a, a steadied movement back. But mm. I, I think what I, I heard from you, though, is that there, mm. the, not only was there a longing, but there was a willingness to see, mm. um, which allowed you to begin not only experiencing a palpable presence of God, yes. but also to really actually look at the data, at the mm. at the like you say, philosophy and intellectual yeah. writings, the substantive mm. writings that are uh, that really substantiate the Christian worldview. Yes, um, I can I can hear a skeptic in the back of my mind saying, <laughs> <laughs> uh, saying, "Well, you just wanted it to be true," and so when you, uh, yeah. You probably, I don't know, you may have encountered this, but you just wanted it to be true. So you see what you want to see, and you wanted Christianity to be true. I mean, but I know 
what I know of you is that you are not someone who, again, on intellectual mm. honesty is is incredibly critical for you. Yes, it is. Uh, yeah. um, as a thinker, as someone mm. who is true to yourself. So yes. um, I would imagine that when you began looking at all of this material, whether it was the Bible mm. or whether it was philosophy or apologetics, mm. that that you you looked at it again with a fairly honest and sober perspective yes. as as I I guess as neutral as one could be, we're always biased. I mean we cannot mm. escape that. But but in a way that was intellectually honest to the material itself, mm. whether it was, you know, whether they were presenting adequate arguments and evidence and logic, whether it was making sense with what you understood about reality. Yes. Um, how how would you answer someone who might push back on you a little bit about that? Yes, well, I, I've thought about this a lot, and I would say that I may have wanted it to be true, um, but even if my, let's say, my emotions or my, my heart is driving me in a certain direction, the my mind is the gatekeeper, and if my mind says no, then the heart stops, as it were, the emotions stop. Um, so I, I have maybe a drive, I had a drive towards Christianity, but I would not have become a Christian if I had not have come to the conclusion that it was true. So I may have wanted it to be true, but I would not have become a Christian if I didn't think it was true, because in a sense, my mind has the last word on these things. Um, so that's how I would answer that. Um, and I'd also say that there are atheists who want atheism to be true. They're, they're equally subjective. I think Thomas Nagel the, the famous atheist at, uh, in New York um, has said, I don't want God to exist, and I'll be honest about it. So I think anybody, any atheist or skeptic who wants to make that line of argument perhaps also ought to consider whether he or she has the same inclination. You know, I want atheism to be true because I don't want to have to deal with a, a metaphysical being or give an account of my life or even lay down my life. Um, hopefully picking up a new life, an authentic life, but I don't want to have to take into account somebody or something, an entity, a deity or whatever, who in some ways is interested in me. Um, so that's how I would answer that question, yes. That's a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah, and I presume because of the nature of, of who you are and... Yes. And your intellectual path, and your studies, and mm. in your teaching pursuits, that mm. you yourself became fully convinced by what you read, whether yes. it was f philosophically, biblically, theologically, mm. that the pieces, mm. as it were, kind of came together and gave yes. you a fully orbed understanding of the world, understanding of the reality that made yes. sense to you and to your yes. mind. Um, that yeah. is that is the best explanation for what you see and experience, both I guess in the universe out there, universe out mm. there, with regard to the historical nature of Christianity, as well as what mm. it sounds like, um, mm. it was fulfilling for you as a person that you, I yeah. presume, uh, that you found the meaning, the the source of meaning yeah. and meaning itself that you were seeking. Yes. I, I did actually. Yes, I mean I. I, it, it's, it's interesting um, because when, when we think about what is the meaning of life, um, it, sometimes it's very hard to say what it is, but I, I would say that my, my worries and concerns about that have been quelled by my knowledge of God. I'm not saying that my mind has been turned off. Quite On the contrary, I think being a Christian has made me a better thinker, and I think it does for everyone who becomes a Christian, or if they... If they allow it to happen, it will. Um, and in a sense, also, there's an element of mystery to this as well, because I obviously, uh, you know, once we become Christians, everlasting life has already begun. And even if we go through the valley of death and, and we are temporarily separated from our bodies, we are still on that everlasting trajectory. It's like a potential infinite. Um, and what manner of challenges and developments and excitement lies ahead of us i think we can only say we had glimpses i don't think we fully know what god has in store for us we know a lot but we don't know everything um and and there is meaning in that as well 
that love has its own way of answering that question. What is the meaning of life? Because when, when a person experiences love for God and experiences God's love for him or her, and then is able to communicate that love to others, th that in itself is an answer to the question, what is the meaning of life? It's not a, it's not a philosophical answer necessarily. It's not the sort of thing that you could put it, put into a philosophical journal, but it's an existential response. It, it's, it's, you, it's the, your manner of living that gives you that, that sense of purpose. Um, and it, it's the most satisfying thing of all. Um, I remember reading somewhere, Soren Kierkegaard wrote in one of his journal entries, not long before he died, I think, that he found it amazing that so many people could go through life not realize, realizing that they were loved by God. And that, that sort of is the tragedy. And that's why it's so important to tell people about the love of God, um, so that they are you know, reunited with their, their creator. Some won't be, unfortunately. Uh, I don't believe everybody will be saved. I'm not a universalist. But thank, thank goodness and thank God for those, those who are, um, who are drawn into his kingdom. Now, Peter, now you have mentioned the gospel, mm. or, mm. or referred to it a few mm. times throughout your story, mm. both in childhood, both in your time of mm. where you were away uh, from yes. faith. And, and now you're speaking of love from a creator. Mm. And I wondered mm. if just in a nutshell, you could describe mm. what the gospel it is, what the gospel is and how that relates to the love from a creator. Yes. Um, well, I believe that God has given humanity free will. Um, and every human being has chosen to disobey God. We have all fallen short of the glory of God, as we're told in Romans. We are all sinners. Uh, the, we are described by Reformed theology as depraved and degenerate, not because we are totally evil, but because every area of our being is infected by sin, um, and that sin is a law in the sense that, it, that people are, in a way, almost um, because it's so ingrained in their personality and character, they, they feel they are under the compulsion of sin. And the gospel is the recognition that every human being stands guilty before God because God is a holy God. And the means by which humans are reconciled to God and become God's children rather than individuals who, who face God's judgment is through the, the substitutionary death of Jesus. Um, Jesus, who is God in as a human being, God, the God-man, as it were, whatever, how we like to say it, God the, the, God, God the Son, assuming human flesh in the form of Jesus of Nazareth, um, dying of crucifixion, paying the penalty for our sins. Um, and so then we are declared righteous. Our status is righteous if we so choose to believe and trust in that death. But obviously there's more to it in the sense that Jesus is resurrected by his Father, his, he's resurrected by his father's love. Um, and that means, therefore, that we are, when we are united with Christ, we are, in a way, resurrected into a new life, to use, you know, perhaps now a rather cliched phrase, we are born again. Now, that doesn't mean to say that we suddenly become perfect, um, but we are in the process of being sanctified. We, we cannot save ourselves. There's nothing in us that, by which we can be saved. It is purely by his grace, which is unmerited favor. That we are saved, um, you know, it, it's His righteousness imputed to us, um, and that is something that that is a covenant that God has with us, everlastingly. God will never go back upon what Christ, God the Son, um, in human uh, personality and form, has done for us, um, and that invitation is to everybody. So. Uh, Christianity makes that claim, make, makes that call to salvation to every single person. Um, and I would add to also to that that every human being is made in the image of God, which is one of the most revolutionary doctrines mm. of Judeo-Christian thinking. Um, and, and the Bible makes it very clear. It says all are made, male and female. It's almost as if the writer was anticipating you know, all the, uh, the rude things said about women and their status no no everybody male female whoever they are wherever they come from they are all made in the image of god and, and we all have that potential to respond to god in a way that can you know uh, by, by which we come to him through salvation 
I'd like to pause for a moment and tell you about a wonderful way for you to take a closer, more intentional look at an important area of your life that's often neglected. When a new year rolls around, we often consider many areas in need of attention in our lives and we set new personal goals. Every year, many of us will go through a physical checkup or a performance review at our workplace. But how often do we take time to review our spiritual life? The C.S. Lewis Institute Annual Spiritual Checkup is designed to help you take a closer look at your spiritual life over the past year and to prayerfully seek God's help in areas where you sense He desires you to grow in the new year. There are strategic questions, articles, and video talks that are designed to help you think through pivotal spiritual areas in your own life. I hope you'll take a look at this complimentary resource. You can access the C.S. Lewis Spiritual Checkup at the Institute website by typing in www.cslewisinstitute.org forward slash ASC. Now back to our story. Yes, yes. So, like you say, everyone is loved by God and can be united mm. with their Creator through that love, through the yes, right. through the person of Jesus. Mm. Thank you for that. Now, no as, as we're um, as we're closing our conversation, mm. I always like to end, particularly uh, with these two questions, because yes. you understand, you know, you have lived what it feels like, what it what it what you think mm. as an atheist, what it what it means to be yes. on the other side of things, um, mm. raising a skeptical eyebrow. Mm. But there may be those who are listening who, as you did at one point, perhaps were willing to consider mm. Christianity. Uh, what advice would you give to a skeptic or someone who's curious about Christianity? Mm. Well... Um, I would say uh, consider Christianity at its strongest points. Um, the, the, the atheist turned deist philosopher Anthony Flew said, whenever you are criticizing a worldview or, or a philosophy, take it on at its strongest points. Don't take on straw men or don't take on that worldview at its weakest points. Look at what, it's very, what, look at what the very best spokespersons are saying on behalf of that worldview. And if you can overcome their arguments, then the rest of the worldview will collapse. It's rather like um, Quine's web of beliefs. You know, if you there are certain sort of strands within the web that upon which the whole web hangs, and if you can cut those, the web will collapse. But if you can't cut those, then the skeptic has got a lot of thinking then to do. You know, why why am I not able to um, overturn the evidence for the resurrection, for instance? Why why is the Kalam cosmological argument so good? That would be the first thing. Um, I think the second thing is I would say to a skeptic, don't get too caught up in new atheism. The, the Dawkins, Hitchens, Dennett, um, Harris brand of atheism, because they do go after the worst examples. Um, it's a very important to, to look at the very best of what Christianity has to say and don't listen to the new atheists who specialize in attacking Christianity at, it, at its sort of, I suppose, its worst parts, you know, in, in terms of individual Christian behavior and whatever. Um, what I mean by that is I don't think there are any intellectual weaknesses in the Christian case, but you can certainly point to Christian individuals whose behavior can be impugned. Um, the other thing I would say um, is please don't expect Christians to be perfect in their behavior. Uh, no Christian, I think, should be saying that they can be perfect in this life. But we are being sanctified. We we still make mistakes. We still do wrong things. I I, I believe that that habits, sinful habits and patterns, are broken. But certainly, Christians can fall into sin. It's an exception, I think, but they can still do it. And therefore, the the skeptics shouldn't be looking for perfection in us. Um, so those are the three things that I I would say. Another thing is. Um, you know, I've met quite a few skeptics who criticize the Bible, but they haven't actually read it. Um, so I would suggest that skeptics, you know, perhaps, you know, one weekend, you know, make a nice cup of coffee or tea, put your feet up, read the Bible, have a commentary at hand so you can understand some of it. 
because I think there's a bit of laziness going on with some skeptics who will say, well, you know, the Bible's a load of fairy tales. Have you actually read it? Uh, no. Okay, so I think you need to go and read it first before you can <laughs> before you can come to a conclusion on it. Um, so those are, those will be the four things that, that I would say to skeptics from my own experience. Now that's, a, that's some great advice. Thank and, you. And uh, Peter, for the yeah. believers, for those who... Mm. have a heart for those who, mm. who don't believe and yeah. want to engage in a meaningful, perhaps an yes. intellectually credible uh, yes. uh, way? How, what would you mm. say to them? I think I'd, I, I have more to say to the Christians than I do to the skeptics. Um, I would say to Christians, please don't think all atheists are the same. Um, I mean, I, I'm aware that, that the, the atheist philosopher John Gray, he, in his book, he says that there are seven types of atheism um, historically. Um, and so therefore, when we're dealing with atheists and skeptics, they, they do come in different categories. I, I've sort of identified in my own experience three. Uh, there are the anti-theists who really are adamantly opposed to, to the idea of God and religion. And Christopher Hitchens fits in that camp. There are the indifferent atheists who um, would say, well, whether God exists or not, my life carries on the way it's going. And then there are the theistic atheists who want there to be a God, but can't see any reason to think there is one. And I've encountered a few of those in my in my time. And they're, they're a very interesting group of people. Uh, there's a, a novelist in England called Julian Barnes who has gone on record as saying, I don't believe in God, but I miss him. Um, and I thought that was a very interesting statement. Um, so we need to take the atheists as they come. Um, I, I think also um, I would say that f for me and, and for many other skeptics, well, when I was, when I was a skeptic and for other skeptics, often we are the only evidence they have of God. You know, the, the messenger and the message can't be separated. So 1 Peter 3.16 talks about giving a reason for the hope that's within you, but it, it does say sanctify your hearts and do present those reasons with, with meekness and fear or, or respect and, and, and humility in some of the uh, more modern trans translations. Um, so, there has, so, so the reason why the message and the messenger go together in the gospel is because we are saying God can transform us. God can take a rotten personality and start to create a work of art. So if the skeptic can't see evidence in our own lives, of that proposition, then he or she is going to ignore us. Um, and and it, it's so important that we, we watch the, um, the the quality of our lives. I mean, I, for example, I, I, I led an Alpha course at a local church a couple of years ago, and I remember saying to this group of skeptics, I mean, I, I had all the hard-bitten atheists in my group. Okay, the other Alpha leader, she, she had some really nice people, but I had all the obnoxious, hard... <laughs> of hard bitten skeptics who wanted an argument with me. Um, and I, I don't know why I, I got them. I can't, I can't imagine. But, but anyway, after a couple of weeks when I had sort of gained their trust, I said to them, I said, is it a case that you want me to present evidence for God's existence? And they said, no, it's not that. And I didn't press them on it, but I realized that I was the evidence, that they were assessing me. They were, they were, they were trying to work out how authentic I was. Does this guy really believe what he's saying? And if we're if we're sort of pretty harshly sceptical with him, will he still welcome us? Will he still be kind to us? Will he forgive us? So I felt as if I was going through a personality test. Ah. Uh, that's really important. And the other thing I would say is that the church really generally needs to grow up in its behavior towards doubting Christians. I think doubting Christians need to be handled very carefully and gently. And to be restored gently, and, and and not people shouldn't be treated as if they are carrying some sort of virus because they are in doubt. Uh, there has to be. I'm not going to use the phrase safe space. I can't stand it. Let us use the good old term sanctuary or refuge. There has to be a sanctuary, a, a place where they can air their doubts, and for people to listen to them, and then say, "Well, have you thought of this? Have you considered reading this?" Um, I can't give you a straightforward answer at the moment, but I'll come back with something um, because I'm aware of, of some very high high profile people who went to their ministers with questions and doubts, and they were told, "Well, you've fallen into sin. You, you know, you're a, you're a terrible sinner. You are doubting the truth," rather than 
saying to them, okay, let's sit down and let me listen to what you're saying to me. And then let me tell you some ways in which you can rethink what's happening and, and perhaps ease the doubt out of them. And um, just very quickly, I'm aware of the time. Um, one other thing is, is in particular before young people go to university um, or go out into the world of work, they, they may have grown up in a Christian cocoon, but they're going to go into an environment where people are going to be quite merciless with their, their faith. I mean, some people will, res will, will respect it, others will be indifferent to it. But as I found out with my friend in my second year, there are people who will take you on. So what, what, or what are we teaching these young people about, you know, the reasons why they're Christians? Um, I, I know of a tragic case recently um, of an individual who went to university to study a science subject and, and she went as a Christian and she came out as an atheist because she could not sort of um, square evolution with Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, and that's so profoundly sad. And, and yes. I know that, that her parents are distraught about this. Yes. Um, and this is what's at stake here. So th those are the things I would say. <laughs> those are excellent. Again, Peter. Thank you. You're, we have been the recipients of a rich, not only story, but also mm. wisdom based upon your you. your years of, of deep consideration mm. and living and, and thinking and really working out what is true what is what yeah. is meaningful what is mm. real mm. and so I, I just want to express deep appreciation to you for you. your very thoughtful and articulate uh, story as well mm. as all of the wisdom that you've given to us today thank you thank you for the opportunity to speak that's, that's much appreciated thank you oh. Well, I, I know that many will be blessed by listening to this. So again, thank you. Good, good. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Side B Podcast to hear Peter's story. You can find out more about Peter and locate his, his writings by looking more closely at the episode notes. For questions and feedback about this episode, you can reach me by email at the Side B Podcast at cslewisinstitute.org. I hope you enjoyed it. If so, subscribe, rate, and share this podcast with your friends and social network. In the meantime, I'll be looking forward to seeing you next time where we'll see how someone else flips the record of their life.